Today we're talking about state and local public finance and optimal fiscal federalism. So fiscal federalism is about what level of government to provide a given good or service. So we have different levels of government, right? We have local government, we have state government, and then of course we have the federal government. And when we think about what level of government should be providing a given good or service, there's trade-offs, there's considerations, right? And we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of different levels today. So today, first, we'll start off talking about optimal fiscal federalism, and we'll discuss the Tebow model. And then we'll move on to discussing redistribution across communities, and we'll in particular discuss intergovernmental grants and the incentives different kinds of grants create in terms of targeted programs, uh, in terms of spending on targeted programs. OK. So recall that when we think about public goods, public goods are goods that are both non-rival and non-excludable, right? So the fact that I'm deriving utility from a public good does not impinge on your ability to derive utility from a public good. Um, you okay? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Dollars. Sorry. Just wanted to make sure. Um, so uh, non-rival means the fact that I'm deriving utility from a public good does not impinge on your ability to der derive utility from that public good. And non-excludable means I can't stop you from deriving utility from the public good. So we think about how much of a public good we should have, right? what the optimal level of provision is. What we really want to do is sum up everybody's marginal benefit from a public good and set that sum equal to the marginal cost of providing that public good. That will give us the optimal level of public goods. So we need to sum up marginal benefits to get the marginal cost. In this Lindahl equilibrium, we could just have everybody pay their marginal benefit, right? If we each pay our marginal benefit of a public good, then we will have the funds necessary to pay for the level that corresponds to the sum of our marginal benefits. Right? That would be the simple, simple Lindahl pricing rule for how to finance the purchase of a public good. Sounds simple, sounds straightforward, but it's not very likely to actually work for a couple of reasons. Well, basically, we have a very difficult problem here. We have the difficulty of getting individuals to actually reveal their preferences, right? Because I have an incentive to not tell you my true marginal benefit of the public good, knowing that that, that some total amount larger than you know, what I would provide on my own will be provided. I have an incentive to lie, because I don't want to pay my own marginal benefit, right? If I understate my marginal benefit, I'll get to pay less. But still, the level of public good will be fairly high, right? So it's hard to get people to actually reveal their preferences. It's also difficult sometimes to know your marginal benefit, right? If I ask Siobhan, Siobhan, what's your marginal benefit from an additional aircraft carrier? It's a very hard question to really answer, right? It's not an easy question to answer. And so it's difficult to sometimes even think about our preferences over some of these public goods. And so it can be a difficult question. This simple setup is likely to have issues. There's also problems with preference aggregation, um, which we won't get too far into in this class, in this course. But your textbook talks a bit about it. But we'll leave it at that basic level. But just know that there's some difficulty aggregating preferences as well. OK, so let's talk about a quasi-market approach to optimal public good provision. Um, what we're going to discuss is the Tebow model, named for Tim Tebow. Not quite. <laughs> it predates him by a little bit. Um, but the Tebow model is a simplistic, stylistic model in which quasi-market forces can afford um, to provide the optimal level of public goods for different communities. The notion behind the Tebow, Tebow model is that folks can cautiously sort themselves across communities. And there are enough communities that every possible level or preference for public goods can be represented by a town, essentially. And everyone with those preferences will move to that town, and that town will provide those public services. Everybody's willing to pay their lump sum tax to provide that service, because they have equal preference, they have identical preferences. And optimal public goods provision is achieved. So the basic idea is that citizens vote with their feet. They leave towns until they and form new towns until they live in towns that are entirely that entirely consist of people that have the same preferences they do. This ability to move or the threat to move also has the added benefit of imposing fiscal discipline for local governments. If you think your residents will leave town if you're not effectively spending their tax revenues on public services, it makes you more efficient at providing those services. So that's sort of the undergirding principles of the Tebow model. 
And there are an assortment of very strong assumptions underlying the Thiebaud model. We'll talk more about them in a second. But if those very strong assumptions hold, it will be true that individuals will divide themselves up across towns with different levels of public goods. Each town, for example, let's say town I, which has n sub i residents, will have an optimal level of public goods, say, of g sub i. It'll be true that we can actually just finance that with a lump sum tax of g i divided by n i. Because everybody in town I wants the same, um, has the same marginal benefit of public goods, we can just impose a lump sum tax. And what do we know about lump sum taxes? What's the golden, be beautiful thing about lump sum taxes? They have no dead weight loss. They're non-distortionary. Because they're not tied to any behavioral decision. It's not a tax on labor income or investment income that will distort labor supply or investment decision decisions. It's not a consumption tax that could potentially distort the consumption saving decision. It's a lump sum tax. In the morning when you wake up, you owe that much in taxes regardless of what you do with your day. And so it's non-distortionary. So in this very simple stylistic model, we can not only achieve the optimal provision of public goods for each community, we can actually have a distortionless way of financing them. Because everyone's identical in each community, they'll be willing to take the level of public goods and divide by the number of residents. Um, does someone need a handout? Someone come in just now? Yep. Of course. But the Tebow model, like I said, rests on some very strong assumptions. Namely, the first thing we assume is that individuals are completely mobile. So they can move from community to, communi from community, to community costlessly. So if you live in, town, in a town and that's, that town's menu of public goods is not to your liking, you can costlessly move to a town that provides exactly the public goods you're looking for. So there's no distance factor. There's no home ownership that makes it difficult to sell and move. There's no kids in local schools. There's none of these frictions that we see in the real world that sort of make mobility difficult, right? It's also just simply costless. You can find a job, or you can live in another community and work the same job. None of these real world, real, real world frictions exist in the Tebow model. Second, we assume that people have perfect information regarding the public goods being offered in different communities and the taxes that they require. So when we look at towns, you know, when you get a real estate agent, you start looking at houses, right? They don't necessarily give you a, a sheet, a, sh a spreadsheet of public goods, right? You don't have this information readily available to you in that kind of menu form. This is a fairly strong uh, assumption as well. Third, and this is important, we assume that there are enough different towns, such that there is a town that has your exact menu of public goods, right? And that you know, requires many, many towns. People are different. We need in a, a continuum of towns, in effect. right? We need to have lots and lots of different towns um, of various sizes that reflect the population that has those preferences. Third, fourth, we assume there are no economies of scale in public goods provision. So there is no, it, 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 we assume that it isn't true that when you provide a public good to more people, the cost per capita goes down. We assume that it's a constant cost per capita, which is a strong assumption for various public goods. Right? There are definitely public goods we can imagine there being economies of scale. And lastly, we assume that there are no externalities to these government or public goods activities. So when community A puts more cops on the street, it only makes community A safer. It doesn't make its surrounding cities any safer, is what we assume. And we know in the real world, like this simple um, cops on the street example, there are likely externalities to some public goods, right? Um, we'll talk about one later on when we do some practice problems. Uh, road maintenance is a public good that certainly has externalities, right? Because having better quality roads makes the lives of your citizens better, right, of your residents, but it certainly also makes driving through your town easier as well for people who live um, outside of your city or town. So we assume that there are no externalities in the Tebow model, and we need all of these assumptions in order for the Tebow model's stylistic results to hold. But there are some implications to the Tebow model that we can test. We can see how well this seems to work in the real world. And you know there is some evidence to buttress the Tebow model. Well, the first testable implication we have is that if the Tebow model is working to some degree, it should be true that when people have more towns to choose from, right? they're just more, a greater number of towns, it should be true that people are able to sort better. And so in each town, folks should be more homogenous in their preferences for public goods. Right? If you have more towns you could live in, 
you're more likely to live with people who have similar preferences for public goods as you do. Second, if you're sorting effectively, you should be more satisfied with the level of public goods your community provides. So these are two implications, and some economists went out and they tried to test these implications. They did so using a survey of households in Michigan. And they compared homogeneity of preferences and satisfaction of public goods in towns that were surrounding a metropolitan area or were in a rural part of Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. And what they found is that in the metropolitan area, folks were more homogenous within each town. So within towns in a metropolitan area, people were more homogenous in their preferences for public goods, and they were more satisfied with the level of public goods provided by their community, suggesting that in a metropolitan area, there are more towns to choose from, right? Rural areas have fewer towns. It's what makes them rural, right? Um, when people were able to have more, where people had more options of towns to choose from, they sorted more effectively, is what their, what their research showed. Of course, rural Michigan and metropolitan Michigan may differ along other lines that lead to greater preference homogeneity and like, greater satisfaction of public goods. But this is one sort of piece of evidence that suggests when there are more towns, people do sort better, that some of the TBO implications do hold. Next, we can also think about the capitalization of public goods and the taxes they require into asset values. And think about how that capitalization changes as sort of evidence for the Tebow model. So if people are voting with their feet, right, it should be true that asset prices or housing prices should equilibrate to reflect the costs and benefits of the taxes needed to pay for public goods and the benefits of those public goods in the community, right? So if you think of it this way, when you go out and buy a house, say, um, you buy a, ta a house in, say, Larchmont. Um, I recently learned that's a town, I believe, in New York, I've learned, right? I learned this in the day section. Um, I, I know lots of Massachusetts towns. I don't know many New York towns. I'm still learning them. So uh, Larchmont is apparently one. Um, so if you go out to buy a house in Larchmont, you are buying a physical structure. You're buying the rights of the land, right? You're buying, in some sense, a piece of equity on what's going to happen to housing prices in Larchmont, right? But you're also buying a claim to the goods and services provided by the town, right? The public safety, the fire department, that stuff, the public schools, importantly, right? And you're agreeing to pay some taxes. In Larchmont, I'm sure it's a lot of property taxes. There could be some sales taxes or something at the local level as well. So you're buying, you're purchasing sort of public goods and paying taxes. That's part of what you're doing. And if you, if you can imagine, you know, if those taxes are actually very well used and the public services they buy are worth exactly the taxes you pay, the net effect of taxes and public goods on housing prices should be nothing, right? If the taxes are not well used and there's a lot of waste, you can imagine that the net effect of the combination of public goods and taxes brings down housing values, right, when they're capitalized. And if, you know, they're extremely well if the tax revenues are extremely well used, you can imagine the public goods and the taxes required to pay for them actually elevate housing prices, right? So when we say capitalization, what we mean is that, you know, when you buy that house, you're buying a stream of public services, right, for the future, out into the future, and you're agreeing to pay taxes into the future. If you take the PDV of those two uh, streams of values, we just see that PDV reflected in the, house of the, in the price of the house. So in California, in the 70s, an initiative called Prop 13 was passed. Prop 13 was a capitation on property tax rates. Because it was a capitation, it affected property tax rates in high tax areas more than it affected property tax rates in low tax areas. Right? That's what a cap generally does. So we should see the change in tax policy and any expected changes in the public services those taxes paid for reflected in housing values, right? If you know your property taxes are going down, that piece should increase property values, right? But we also know that, you know, those taxes went to pay for something. So if the taxes are going down, the public schools may get worse, right? Or the road repairs may be longer. Um, or they may take longer to do road repairs or, you know, uh, public safety may be worse. And so we should see some change. Um, we should see not quite the full value of the taxes, right? Increase. We should, the increase in home prices should not be the full value of the taxes because the, 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 you're also losing some services and those are benefits, so you're losing some benefits. So we should see an increase in property values that's not equal to the full PDV of the taxes. But in fact, in California, researchers found that the decline in property taxes was almost fully capitalized into housing values. That's surprising, right? We wouldn't expect that. 
Because for this to be true, for housing values to go up by the entire amount of the, of the tax cut, it would have to be true that either A, the residents didn't value the public services at all, right? The fact that they're going to lose some services they don't, doesn't bother them at all. Or B, they don't expect to lose public services. They only expect a tax cut and not to see a reduction in public services. So those, that seems like a crazy, uh, two crazy kind of uh, beliefs, right? But it turns out the housing prices were exactly right. There wasn't a reduction in public services right away. Because even though there was a reduction in local tax revenue, state dollars were used to maintain public services in areas that saw property tax cuts. So the housing, value, the housing change actually was, was right, that, that those communities that had, had been paying very high tax rates saw a cut in taxes, a reduction in taxes, but didn't see a, a commensurate reduction in public services because the state kicked in dollars to pay for the public services. So in fact, yes, the, these, housing, the, these residents saw nothing but a tax cut. And so that's exactly what we saw in housing prices, and it was right going forward for a few years. Of course, down the line, the state government gets into trouble, right, because it's trying to top off spending at the local level through straight state revenues. And so um, we have budgetary problems at the state level rather than the local level. OK. And that's actually a lot of the story of California is partly this. It's that local taxes were capped. Folks didn't want to necessarily see the reduction in public services that that reduction in taxes required. And so that brought the state in. Um, into, the fe into the local government game in the sense they needed to provide revenue to the localities to provide education, to provide public sa uh, safety services. And so that, made, um, that, that, was a big, that was a big burden on the state government. And a lot of California's problems actually go back to Prop 13 in part. So what else do we know about, about fiscal federalism from the Tebow model? Well, the implications of the Tebow model about decentralization, decentralization, fiscal federalism, what level of government should be providing services, these are all different ways of describing the same idea, right? So what else do we know from the Tebow model? Well, we know that the extent to which public goods, PGs are just public goods, should be provided by the local level versus a higher level, so the local versus state, local versus federal, state versus federal, the level of government at which the services should be provided, the public goods should be provided, is determined by three things. The first is the tax benefit linkage. So if taxes are really seen by folks as basically a fee for service, right? if people see their property taxes as basically tuition fees for the public schools, right? they really see them that way, or they see an increase in taxes as simply what, they, what they're going to pay for additional cops on the street, that moves local taxes from the realm of true taxes to something that's a lot more like going to the store and buying apples. Right? If you think an extra $1,000 of property taxes is going to get your kid a better education and you see it one for one that way, it's almost like you're paying $1,000 for a better education for your kid. Right? That's the tax benefit linkage. The degree to which you see your taxes as buying you services or goods. The stronger that linkage, the less distortionary the tax is because it's less like a tax and more like a simple price right, for a good or service. So if that linkage is strong, it makes more sense for the local government to provide the public good because that linkage is more clear at the local level. Right? There's a smaller scope for redistribution. You see the good very close, up close. And there's a lot of sort of consumer preferences reflected in local goods. So you're likely to have better tax benefit linkage at local government levels. For example, most of us don't see an increase in our ordinary income tax rates at the federal government by the federal government translating to any particular public good. Right? We don't think about, we pay a little more, we're going to get an aircraft carrier. Right? Federal income tax is a very weak, weak tax benefit linkage. Payroll taxes, on the other hand, right, can, have a very strong, can have a stronger tax benefit linkage. Because as you pay into Social Security, what do you know you're getting on the other end? Benefits when you retire. Right? So payroll taxes, depending on where you are in the income distribution, for sure. Because we know from our study of Social Security, we know that benefits um, are more generous for those who have lower levels of income, right? And as you earn more and more, there's a progressive structure, and so you're getting a, a, a lower sort of benefit to tax uh, ratio as you make more and more. But for moderate income Americans, Social Security taxes, by and large, translate into Social Security benefits later, and so there's a very strong tax benefit linkage. But most you know, federal income taxes have a much weaker tax benefit linkage, and it's clearly going to be true that you know, local programs would be more directly linked and we might, have, might see stronger tax benefit linkages at the local level. Second, we're going to want to think about whether there are positive externalities or negative externalities 
um, or spillovers. This is positive, just think externalities or spillovers, right? With public goods, it's generally positive, right? The idea that when uh, one community provides public goods, another community might benefit from them is the positive externality. So public goods by nature, right, are non-rival, non-excludable. That's what we consider them. Of course, most public goods are not purely non-rival, nor purely um, non-excludable. Like public education, for example, one more kid in the classroom is sort of non-rival, non-excludable. 50 more kids in the classroom, right, starts to get the, 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 there is actually, actually rivalry, right? But to, some, to a large degree, public goods are public goods. And when one community provides public goods to its residents, there is, there is the possibility that the benefits of those public goods affect more people, more, affect uh, residents of other communities as well, as well. Affect people who don't live in that particular town. We can think of, we talked about cops, right? When there's increased public safety in one community, it likely affects crime levels in the neighboring towns, right? We can think of other examples, like um, uh, we t we'll talk about transportation later, even efforts like city parks, right? Town parks, you know, as you drive by, the town is prettier, right? These are all things that have some spillovers and externalities. You can think about healthcare as having this, this, this potential as well. Um, sometimes we can also think about uh, spillovers and externalities as even being negative in the sense of um, race to the bottom competition to attract business. So local communities, one of the public goods they sometimes offer their residents is they try to attract businesses to locate in the town, right? They're trying to bring a big plant in to offer jobs. So as communities compete against each other to attract those plants, they might offer them tax cuts. They might offer them particular public services like roads built for the plant, right? And so we could think of there also being negative externalities um, provided by towns. Um, that, that negatively affect other communities, right? Because they're competing against them. And you can imagine a higher level of government um, can help reduce the negative externalities, much like they can take the positive externalities into account. For example, when uh, you want to think about an interstate highway system, no one asks the states to do it on their own, right? Who did the interstate highway system? The federal government. Because any interstate, right, if you, a, a state that has neighbor, neighbors, right, a non-coastal state, whatever interstate highways they construct, is going to affect the quality of the interstate highway system, all told. And so there would be positive externalities, and you would want to have a higher level of government provide that public good. Does that make sense? Because a higher level of government can simply reflect the externalities, that local governments are going to act like individuals and not think about the fact that the, when they provide some goods and services, it has a marginal benefit to others. The last thing you're going to want to think about is the economies of scale. So in some public goods, it's, it's clear that there are economies of scale. Right? It makes no sense for New York City to build its own aircraft carrier. Right? So there are economies of scale, and certainly in some, in some public goods. And the more there is an economy of scale in the production of a public good or service, the more sense it makes for a higher level of government to provide it just because they'd have the benefit of a higher quantity. Right? So the per, per unit cost would be lower. OK. So that's what we're going to talk about when it comes to optimal fiscal federalism. We're moving on to the second part of today, the second part of today's lecture, which is redistribution across communities. So we're going to do some work on the board for this. We're going to do the budget constraint stuff on the board, but there's a little bit of lead up. So in the T-Bow model, communities form, form basically for the efficient provision of public goods, right? If you're living in a town and you wish there was municipal garbage pickup, you leave that town, either move to a town that's just like yours but has municipal garbage pickup, or if that town doesn't exist, you start a town, right? That's the idea of the Tebow model. So in that model, in the Tebow model, everyone is living in a community that's perfect for them, that has the absolute perfect combination of uh, public goods and taxes to pay for them for them. And the efficiency comes from the fact that everyone can find a town that has the right combination for their preferences. So when we think about there being inequalities, right, suppose in the Tebow model, the very stylized Tebow model, we see a community that's spending $13,000 a kid on education versus another community that's spending $300 a kid on education. In the Tebow world, where everyone is identical, that's another thing, their preferences are different, but their resources are the same, right? In the Tebow world, the fact that one community is spending 13K a kid on, on public education and one is spending $300 a kid on public education, what does that reflect to us? Differences in preferences, right? We, that these folks just want to spend more on education. These folks want to spend less. We think of that difference in the Tebow world as actually a sign of efficiency, that people are able to find the menu of public goods and services that match their preferences. There's enough towns that there is a $300 town and a $13,000 town. 
we think of that inequality or inequity as a fair outcome based on different preferences. But the TBO world, you know, is, we don't see a, a role for redistribution in the TBO world. But there are actually efficiency arguments for a redistribution. And it's because we sort of, it's the failures of the TBO mechanism, first and foremost, right? If people can't sort, suppose moving is costly, like it is in the real world, right? You have a job in New York, you can't easily move to Ohio, right? So if there are weaknesses in the TBO mechanism, so due to failed assumptions, maybe, uh, maybe moving is costly, let's go back to the assumptions we can think about. So maybe moving is costly, maybe you don't know what the public goods are in a community before you move in, right? Your real estate agent doesn't always give you the full menu, right? You can imagine them being different. There may not be enough towns, right? We know that there aren't an infinite number of towns in, first of all, there is not an infinite number of towns, right? Second, there aren't even a lot of towns in some parts of the country, right? And those towns are far apart. So the fact that there aren't a lot of towns and the fact that moving is costly together makes sorting hard. That there could be economies of scale, so your small town may not find it efficient to provide a public good or service because of the fixed costs are so large and there are very few residents, right? There could be economies of scale. We see um, in some communities that there's only part-time fire, um, uh, fire services or that there are sort of um, shared services among communities that may be less effective than having your own. And, and finally, that you know, we could imagine cases where there are externalities, right? And we'll get to that in a second. So any of these failures of the TBO mechanism, such that people are not sorting effectively, will make those inequities or inequalities in spending signs of inefficiency. So suppose you live in the town that's spending $300 per kid on public education. You would really like to live in a town that spent more. If moving is costly for you, you are unable to get the public services you would like in your town, and that inequality is actually a sign, right? It's a sign that, that, that not everyone in the $300 per kid town is happy with that level of spending. So the inequality is actually a sign of of there being sort of inefficient, an inefficiency in the system. So if the TBO mechanism isn't providing for perfect sorting, inequality can be a sign of, of, of inefficiency, in fact. Second, if there are externalities, right? If there are vast differences in the provision of some services that have externalities, let's go back to the public safety example. If some towns are choosing to really under, under provide fire safety, for example, they have very few firemen. That has a negative externality on the neighboring towns, right? If there's a brush fire in said community and there's insufficient fire safety, right, there aren't enough firemen, that fire is going to do what? Spread, right? And that's a negative externality. And in that case, more equal spending would be more efficient because the town that is choosing to not spend very much on fire safety is not taking the negative externality its underspending is inflicting on its neighbors, right? Both of these are reasons why inequity or inequality in spending levels on public goods and services can actually be a sign of inefficiency and why redistribution could actually lead to more efficient outcomes. So let's go, so, so you know, we've talked about, so we've talked about the TBO mechanism, we've talked about how it works and how in that stylized world it's terrific. We've talked about reasons why the TBO mechanism may fail to allow for the kind of sorting we need to see for the TBO mechanism to work. We've talked about why redistribution can actually not just make things more equal, but could also potentially increase efficiency. So one of the questions that relates to this public goods provision question, the quality of public goods pr provision, is education, right? Education is a contentious topic, and one of the big debates in education is about the very different levels of spending across different communities in our country and in our state, even our, you know, within a state, right? Different districts spend very differently. So one key question is, should spending on education be equalized? We've seen debates here in New York, right? This was the big, the big um, issue of the 70s and 80s in New York, was equalizing school spending. We see this as a, as a perennial sort of local issue, right? Differences in spending. So why, should we, why would we maybe want to equalize school spending? Well, first of all, there might be some externalities. We think you know, the best evidence here is actually on a citizenship, citizenship front. So in terms of, in terms of voting, in terms of involvement in local government, in terms of um, not having any involvement with the criminal justice system, in terms of volunteering, in terms of spending time with their children, there are actually large positive gains from education in terms of citizenship. This is the best documented part of the externalities. When it comes to productivity, the case is a little weaker because by and large, economists think 
the returns to education are mostly privately enjoyed. So you invest, that's why we sort of have individual financing of education by and large, right? The government may help provide credit to those who um, have trouble accessing capital markets because they're very young, right, and don't have collateral. So that's Pell Grants and student loans and all that stuff. But we basically allow individuals to finance their educations. One reason that that makes sense is that most of the returns to education come to you in terms of higher salaries in your life. There is some evidence that there are productivity gains to your coworkers from you being more educated, but those are that, that's much weaker result than the citizenship side. But there might be, there are clearly positive externalities to education, certainly on the citizenship front. So another reason we might think that we should equalize school spending, right? Why we might take the Thibault equilibrium um, as inefficient and worry about it um, from an equity and efficiency perspective is also that you know higher income parents may simply choose more education than lower income parents. Right? This is the flaw of the Thibault mechanism in a sense, that people don't have equal resources. Right? You may live in a town that spends $300 per child on public schools, not because you think that's the appropriate level of spending, but because you can't afford to pay the taxes to, pay, to, to, to spend anymore. Right? There's budget constraints. And so higher income parents may choose to live in an area that has higher education spending, mostly because they're higher income, not because their preferences are different than lower income families. So that's one reason we might worry about spending, spending differences. So these are all reasons we might worry about spending differences as a, thing, as a way to describe these. And the last reason is paternalism, good old paternalism. So we worry, right, because when we think about the TiVo mechanism, right, we think that people are efficiently sorting according to their preferences in a different communities, right? But who is doing the sorting? Which members of a household get to choose where they live? The adults, right? The adults pretty much decide, parents decide, and kids kind of come along like the refrigerator comes along, right? Maybe some families vote, but it, by and large, it's adults who choose what communities to live in, what menu of public goods sounds appealing, right? These are all decisions made by parents. And we, you know, we by and large think most parents have their children's ultimate good at heart, right? They are their parents. But we worry that there could be some subpopulations that somehow aren't taking their children's lifetime utility into account properly. They may sort of undervalue their children's utility for some reason. Um, they may not be able to correctly think about the impact of certain public goods on their children's lifetime outcomes, right? They may not really see the value of better public education at the K through 12 level on their children's lifetime outcomes. And so they may not be valuing education, for example, appropriately. And so, or they just might be making dumb decisions when it comes to public goods for whatever reason, right? So paternalism is some reason. It is one reason too that we think that we might fear that some parents underinvest in the education of their children, um, and we want to correct for that. So these are arguments in favor of equalizing school spending, despite the fact that in the TIBO world we look at inequality and we say, look, preferences are different, right? These are reasons to sort of depart from um, satisfaction with the TIBO equilibrium. So how do we equalize school financing in the U.S.? Well. Why, first of all, why do we have to do so? Why do we have to equalize school fi funding? Well, nearly half the funding for primary and secondary education in America comes from local revenues. So city, maybe county, but mostly city revenues. The vast majority of those revenues come from property taxes in the US. Property taxes are one of the few asset value taxes we have. It's basically like a wealth tax in some sense, right? We don't tax the income return on your house. We tax what your, what your house is worth, the stock, right? Property taxes are one of the few wealth type taxes we have in the US. And property taxes provide the vast majority of the local piece of K through 12 spending. We know that property values are different in different parts of America. I mean, the New York Times has a whole section dedicated to this, right? The what does $625,000 get you section. Anyone seen this? Yeah, it's like you can get uh, you know, five square feet of land in Manhattan, or you can get like a colonial, right, in name a state, in Kentucky, right? Yes. So we know the New York Times tells us this every week, that property values are very different in different parts of this country. And thus, when we levy taxes on property values, the resources available for education differ across communities. And so we have differences in spending, right? If we, the local piece of K through 12 financing varies a lot across communities. And so states sometimes come in and they try to offset these inequities by collecting some revenues at the state level and redistributing them to low resource districts, so districts that have low tax bases. 
for those of you, how many of you are interested in education and education issues? Some of you, yeah, a lot of you, a few of you. Okay, I'm not going to ask how many of you are really interested in tax issues, but I hope some of you are. And if there is some overlap, or so those of you who are interested in education and are open to tax stuff, I think this is a really interesting policy area. How to design these redistribution programs correctly such that the incentives are good. Because there are a few different ways we can do this, right? You can say, I think New Jersey has a rule that it's like if you spend more than X percentage of the median spending on kids in public schools in New Jersey, then some fraction of any additional revenue you raise gets sent to the state, and the state sends it back to, low, to lower resource communities. Right? That's one way of doing it. Some states just say, you know what, we're taking 20 cents of every property tax dollar you raise. There are various ways of doing this. Right? Some states have a nonlinear tax schedule. Some states say, after X amount per kid, we're just confiscating the rest. Right? Those have very different tax rates and different, tax in and different incentives tied to them. And getting this right has a lot to do with how effectively we have, how effectively we provide public education. Right? Because a lot of these schemes will lead to leveling. They'll mechanically lead to leveling. But what we'd like to do by and large is level up. Right? We want to see communities that are spending less spend more because we give them resources. But if you design these incentives incorrectly, such that you're imposing very high tax rates on some local schools, on some local districts, you're going to instead see a leveling down, where the high spending districts start spending less because they get so little value for any dollar of tax, that, for any additional dollar of taxation, taxes that they raise. And so I think this is a really interesting, complicated problem, and it could use smart people working on it. OK, so now we're going to get to the governmental grants piece. So one way we so one way we redistribute is simply we you know we create schemes especially in education to have sort of finance equalization. Another way we see redistribution across communities and particularly across states is intergovernmental grants. So this would be a grant from a higher level of government to a lower level of government. So federal to state, state to local, right? That's the kind of grant transfer uh, grant making we're talking about. So. Federal, um, there's, there's two kinds of redistribution. So we'll talk about grants in a second, but there's another kind of redistribution that happens too. And it's on the tax side. You can think of the grants as the spending form of redistribution. There's also redistribution on the tax side. Because what do we allow itemizers to deduct on the federal income tax schedule? State and local taxes, right? So state and local taxes are spending you do, or taxes you pay, to your state and local government. You can imagine that our tax dollars that go to the city of New York and the state of New York, right, buy us some public services. I mean, there's some stuff that happens that you know, we don't think of as public services, but it buys us a whole bunch of public services, right? For example, our city tax dollars help pay for the MTA, right, in part, right? Our city tax dollars pay for uh, the public safety we enjoy. Our state tax dollars pay for public parks, right? All of these things are government services and goods that we enjoy as residents of the city and state of New York. But when we pay for them with tax dollars, as New Yorkers, right? But who else pays for them? Californians and Ohioans and Floridians. How do they pay for them? Because we're allowed to deduct our state and local taxes from our federal taxes. That's effectively a federal subsidy, right? It's effectively a, sub a federal subsidy. For every dollar you're spending on state and local services, the federal government is kicking in some number of cents. That number of cents is determined by your marginal tax rate, of course. But the federal government is kicking in some number of cents for each dollar you spend or pay in state and local taxes. So there is a subsidy from the federal government to state and localities, states and localities through the deductibility of state and local taxes. What do we think about that? Is that necessarily efficient? Suppose there are no positive externalities from state and local services. Let's go for the extreme, extreme view. And when we subsidize something, what do we get? More or less of it? More of it, potentially too much of it, right? So it could be inefficient. We could have an over-provision of state and local services because of the federal subsidy to state and local taxes. What about horizontal and vertical equity? So suppose you, know, you, didn't, you were just born in a state. You didn't really, you know, you didn't really move. But so people who are born in Ohio just live in Ohio, and people born in New York live in New York. Just imagine this extreme world. The deductibility of state and local taxes is sort of unequal, right? It's horizontally unequal. You sort of, you know, what you pay in taxes, you get different levels of federal, ta uh, federal subsidies because of sort of the state you live in, in to some degree, right? It's sort of horizontally unequal. 
it's definitely unequal when it comes to itemization, right? Only itemizers get to deduct this stuff. So you can imagine a bunch of ways it's horizontally inequitable. What about vertical equity? Who is this most valuable to? Folks who are, sorry? Wealthier. Yeah, exactly. The people with higher marginal tax rates, this deduction is worth more to them. It's also true, by and large, that um, state and local taxes are higher in wealthier states. Our good old coastal states tend to have more taxes and more public services. And so in effect, this tax subsidy does sort of tend to accrue, not just sort of within state, but even across states to, to, wealthier, to wealthier folks. And it's always a huge challenge to tax reform. Right, we've talked about tax reform. Tax reform is really about plugging the holes right, that are in the base and then bringing the rate down because we've sort of filled the base up. There are, there, we've talked about there are you know, some silly loopholes that we could get rid of, right? The, the tax credit to bow and arrow manufacturers. You know, we can come up with a bunch of these silly little tax credits, right? But that's not big money, right? We've talked about how that's kind of just a little money. The big money is stuff like home mortgage deduction, exclusion of employer provided health insurance. And in that top five is the deductibility of state and local taxes. So every time we want to really undertake massive tax reform, there are folks who say, you know what would be a nice big revenue source is not subsidizing other taxes, right? There are folks who feel this way. And who gets up and says, no, 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 we have a God-given right to the deductibility of state and local taxes? Our senators, right? Our senators here in New York, the senators in California, high tax states are gonna are gonna defend this. And so it's one of these things. It's just a political issue, and uh, it's 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 oh, it, it comes up periodically with tax reform, and we see this debate again. Okay, so that's redistribution through the tax code. Let's talk about redistribution on the spending side, and that's intergovernmental grants. So again, grants from higher levels of government to lower levels of government. So there are three major kinds of intergovernmental grants. The first is the unconditional block grant, a fixed amount that can be spent however the recipient wants. We don't actually have very many of these left at the federal level anymore. We used to have a program called uh, general revenue sharing. Um, it was gotten rid of in the 70s or 80s. It used to just basically be that some fraction of federal tax revenues would be sent back to the states in these unconditional grants with poorer states getting bigger grants and richer states getting very small grants, right? General revenue sharing is what, was what it was called. Um, we don't really have much of that today. So the flavor of an un unconditional block grant is something like, hey, Texas, here's $3 billion. No strings attached, just a check, right? That's what an unconditional block grant would, feel, would, would be like. A conditional block grant is a fixed amount that must be spent on a particular program or area, right? That would be like, hey, Texas, here's $3 billion to spend on, um, a, on welfare, on cash welfare, right? And that's actually how TANF really works. TANF was changed from a matching grant to a conditional block grant as part of welfare reform. And I hope by the end of lecture today, you can see what, um, why that was done, why it was moved from a matching grant to a, condi to a conditional block grant, because some people were, were interested in changing the incentives and they wanted to change them in that way. So they changed the form of the grant. And hopefully by the end of lecture, you'll see why that is. So TANF works that way. You, we, write, we give states grants to be spent on cash welfare, right? It's a conditional block grant. And the last kind of grant is a matching grant. A matching grant is, sort, is, a, is a amount of transfer from the higher level of government to the lower level of government determined by how much the lower level of government decides to spend on the program. So this is something like a one for one match. So for every dollar the state of New York spends on say Medicaid, the federal government could come in and give them a dollar, right? The subsidy is more like 40 cents, but it's the same spirit. So for every dollar the state of New York spends on Medicaid, the federal government will kick in 40 cents in Medicaid, of Medicaid spending in the state of New York. So that's a matching grant. It's matching spending with a fixed percentage. So Medicaid works like that, and AFDC, the old form of cash welfare, used to work like that. And as part of welfare reform, we made it an, an a conditional block grant. OK, so I'm going to do this little preview of the grants, and then we're going to start actually drawing the pictures. So when it comes to maximizing the welfare of the receiving community, so of the local government, um, in the case of a transfer from the state to the local government, or, in the case, or the state government in the case of a grant from the federal to the state government. The local community's welfare is maximized by an unconditional block grant. 
And that's because that's giving them money and letting them choose how to spend it to best increase their welfare, right? to best increase their utility. The recipient government is free to spend according to its citizens' preferences, and it will do so to maximize utility. What kind of grant will actually cause the recipient government, government to spend most on, to spend the most on the targeted program? That's going to be the matching grant. And you'll see that the matching grant has this added bonus of also inducing a substitution effect. And that's why it's more effective in actually inducing spending on the targeted program. So we'll see all this stuff starting now. OK. So I think we can. OK. Sweet. OK, so let's go ahead and start. The first one, I believe, is the unconditional grant, right? Oh, no, the matching grant comes first. What am I saying? Make sure this is right. OK, so we're going to talk about a situation where we have a, a transfer from the state government to a local government. So think of like, um, like a town or a city. And the program they're targeting is education. So they want to incentivize the local community to spend more on education. So on our x-axis, we're going to have education spending. I'm going to call it education spending. Is this big enough? Sort of. It's just not in the right spot. I'm going to call it education spending. But I want you to think of this as education consumption, too, right? It's how much education this community is consuming. I really just can't get this to work. There we go. OK. Oh, I see. What, oh, we need this to, to go higher. Um, OK, so you can't see the label on the x-axis, but I think you'll survive. Um, and what we're going to put on the y-axis is other goods. So other goods the local government could spend on. So you could think of it as education versus cops and public parks and road quality, other things the local government could be spending on. So initially, our town has a million dollars in resources. right? And I'm, I'm going to write the numbers on here in terms of thousands. So it can either spend. A million dollars, sorry, let me extend this axis. A million dollars on education or a million dollars on other public goods, right? That's this maximum spending um, amount. The state government, off, so, so yeah, let's keep going. So the state government offers this local community a matching grant for education. So for each dollar they spend on education, the state government will kick in an additional dollar of education. So if this local community took all of its tax, all of its tax revenues and spent on other goods, they could at most buy a million dollars worth of other goods. Right? That's their budget. But if they spent their million dollars on education, the state would then kick in how much? A million dollars. And they could get a total of $2 million. So the matching grant effectively pushes the x-intercept out to 2 million. Uh, OK. I'll write a little smaller next time. Um, OK, so we know that this town initially was splitting its million dollars in tax revenues between education and other goods, such that it was spending half a million dollars on education and half a million dollars on other, sorry, that's just 500, on other goods. After the matching grant, what's happened? Is this town now richer or poorer with the matching grant? Richer. richer. So it's going to want to spend more on everything, including education. 
What about the slope of their budget constraint? Is the budget constraint flatter or steeper now? So the price of education is effectively lower, right? So they're going to want to spend more on education to, for the substitution effect too. So here, both the substitution effect and the income effect are going to cause this community to spend more on education through the matching grant. It turns out they're in fact going to spend, um, they're going to in fact consume $750,000 worth of education. So they're going to move out here. So how much more education are they consuming? $250,000, right? But who is paying for that $750,000 of education consumption? How much is the town paying for? Half, right? What's half of 2750? 375. So the town is paying 375. Who's paying the other 375? Via the matching grant, it's going to be the state government. So out of a million bucks, sorry, this is not 750, this is 625. So out of a million bucks, the local government is spending 375 on education. It has how much of its million bucks left over? 625. And it's going to spend that on other goods. Kelly, question. Um, where did you get a million dollars as a budget? Um, I'm, that, that's a given. Oh. It's a given. That's me, that, that I gave you. And the 500,000, 500,000 I give you, and the 750 equilibrium I give you. That's all stuff. Because where they locate on any of these budget constraints, what do we need to know? We need to know the shape of the indifference curve to know that, right? So I have to tell you that piece. You can't pull that out of thin air. You need to know the shape of their preferences. Because what do their preferences really tell us? It tells us how they, consume, how they combine different levels of education spending and other good spending together and derive utility from it, right? The indifference curves tell us how much utility they get from different combinations of spending on education versus other goods. And so we need the shape of the indifference curve to know exactly where this community um, actually locates on the budget constraint. OK, so if I asked you, based on this problem, right, for what you know, you know, you can tell me they spend $625,000 now on other public goods. So they're getting a transfer in total for, of what from the, from the state government? 375, right? Of that 375, how much of it is going to, to increase education spending? How much more education are they consuming? 250. So they got a, basically getting a transfer of 375. They're putting 250 into education. Where is the other 125? Other stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Siobhan? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So they, they, I told you they're going to they're going to now consume seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of education, and we know the matching grant is one for one. So for each dollar the local government spends, the state government's going to kick in a dollar. So we know the seven fifty is comprised of half government, half local, half state. So three seventy five is just seven fifty divided by two. It's a good question. I mean, I want this to all be very clear because what we're mapping on the x axis is not what the local government is spending on education. It's how much education is being consumed in that community, right? What total spending on education in that community is. Where part of that spending is being done by the federal government. In fact, part of the spending on other goods is being done by the state government in this case, right? By the higher level of government. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I, I want you to keep this result in the back of your mind, right? So in equilibrium, these guys spent 750, 375 of that came from the state government. Because of both the income effect and the substitution effect, they increased their spending on education by $250,000, right? The matching grant. OK, let's do another one. Let's do the unconditional block grant. So I'll write a little bit smaller. OK, so on our x-axis, we're going to have education. On our y-axis, we're going to have other goods. We have our initial budget constraint of a million dollars, right? They can spend a million dollars on education or a million dollars on other goods. We're going to offer them, the state government is going to give this community an unconditional grant of $375,000. So they can spend that $375,000 on education or on other goods. It's up to them. How do we reflect that in the budget constraint? 
Does that change the slope of the budget constraint? No, right? The prices of this stuff is not, it, um, the prices aren't any different. They just have more resources. So it's a shift out of our budget constraint. It's a parallel shift out. In fact, the most any they can consume of either good, right, is one is one thousand three seventy five. So one point three seven five million. That's their new budget constraint. Their unconditional block grant budget constraint. Initially, they were spending such that they were spending five hundred thousand on education and five hundred thousand on other goods, right? Suppose I told you that under this unconditional grant, they will increase their spending by $75,000. Where would the new equilibrium be? Over here it would be at 575, right? My indifference curves are going to clearly intersect, right? I'm not a very good artist. So part of what I hope to do today for you is get you ready for the exam to see what requires you being careful and what doesn't. I'm a terrible artist, right? I'm a god for, I'm a god awful, like, illustrator. Like, the 500 isn't even really a midpoint on this thing, right? It's euphemistic at the worst. But it's okay, it doesn't matter. I don't care if 300 is not at, you know, one third of the distance between, or at 30% of the distance between zero and 1,000, right? This isn't stuff I'm grading on. As long as the picture makes sense, it's fine with me. You'll see how bad this will get in terms of being drawn to scale. I can't draw to scale. I'm terrible at it. But you don't need to draw to scale to convey the information you need to convey to me. Think of it as drawing a map. You need to explain to me the implications of the model. It's OK if it's not to scale. And we'll, I'll show you exactly what I mean. OK, so I told you they increased spending right by 75000 So they're going to be over here. How much was the total grant again? It was How big was the total grant? 375, so how much are they going to increase spending on other goods? So they're going to be at 800. For example, 800 is closer to 500 than 1,000 in my picture, right? It's actually really close to 500. This is not to scale at all, but it's going to convey all the information we need to convey, so it's going to be okay. Sorry, this should be, yeah, like there. Okay, 800. Okay, now there comes, here comes the tricky part. So education spending went from 500 to 575. What drove this increase in education spending? Is there a substitution effect here? No, because the slope's exactly the same, right? Is there an income effect here? Yeah, right? This local government, this locality, this community is now richer. It's 375,000 richer, and it's going to choose to spend more on everything, including education. It chose to increase education spending by $75,000. Okay. So here's the tricky question. Com combining what we learned from the matching grant case and this unconditional block grant case. So I rigged this problem. I rigged it in a very special way. I made the size of the unconditional grant equal to the transfer the state government made to the local government in the matching grant, right? Because in equilibrium, what did the matching, how much did this, this community spend under the matching grant? 750. How much of that came from the state government? 375, right? Then I set up this unconditional block grant question and told you if they get $375,000 in transfers, they're going to spend $75,000 more on education. We know that there's only the IE, the income effect, with the unconditional grant. We know with the matching grant there was a substitution effect and an income effect. Here's the tricky question. How big was the substitution effect with the matching grant? 175, exactly. And Jeff got that, right? Because how did he figure out it was 175? How much did education spending go up between, under the matching grant? It went from 500 to 750. There's a $250,000 increase in education spending, which was driven by both the income effect and the substitution effect, because that was the matching grant, right? And then I gave you a case that had the same level of transfer, so just the income effect of, of that situation, and that increased education spending by 75,000. So 75,000 of the 250,000 250, was driven by the income effect. 250 minus 75 is 250 minus 75 equals 175. So you can think of this as, uh, this is IE plus SE. We subtracted off the IE, we got the SE. 
Sorry, I'm writing and you can't see it. It's 175. 250 less 75 is 175. And that's where Jeff got. The substitution effect was 175,000. The income effect was 75,000. I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. And the whole reason we could actually back out the size of the substitution effect here is that I rigged this. I rigged it such that the size of the unconditional grant was equal to the transfer made in equilibrium under the matching grant. Why do I keep saying in equilibrium? Because with the matching grant, the size of the transfer is determined by the new budget constraints and the community of indifference curve, right? It's the equilibrium, it's, it's that tangency point that determines how big the grant is. OK, let's do the last one, which is the conditional block grant. So I'm actually going to draw it on the same picture, and you'll see why. So this is the same setup. The state government offers the local government a grant of $375,000. But now, the state government requires that the local government spend the $375,000 on education. So what does that really mean? What's the most this community can spend on other goods? A million bucks, right? But all, all of their values, they can spend an additional 375 on education. So really, this is like taking the unconditional grant and chopping off this part of it. So that the new budget constraint is this piece. After $375,000 of spending, the condition on the grant is kind of met. And it becomes just like the unconditional grant. Does that make sense? Because the most it can ever, this community can ever spend on other goods is a million bucks. But then it can use the 375000 right? It's already met that condition. So would we ever see communities in this range? No, right? Because they can spend, they can, they're all, they're all going to aggregate at this kink point. There's a kink point here. Exactly. So our community was initially here, right? How is this town going to react to the conditional block grant? They were here. If this is where they locate uh, with the unconditional block grant, where are they going to locate with this conditional block grant? Same spot, right? Because how much were they initially spending on education? $500,000. If the state government says, hey, local community, here's a check for $375,000, but spend it on education, what's the mayor of the local community going to do? So he initially, right, before the grant was made, he took his local revenues, the million dollars of revenues, he looked, you know, they either had a referendum or he knows the, the preferences of his community really well, and he said, okay, the way we're going to divide up our budget is we're going to spend 500000 on education, we're going to spend 500000 on other stuff. So he had two piles of money. Then the governor came down and said, hey, mayor, I'm going to offer you this check for $375,000, but you've got to spend it on education. You can't spend it on other stuff. What's the mayor going to say? Awesome, right? He's going to take the check. What is he going to take out of the half a million dollars he had set aside for education? $375,000 pop this in, right, pop the check in, and then he's going to take that $375,000 of regular cash and divide it between other goods and education. Because to him, the condition isn't binding. His town was already spending more than $375,000 in education. Whether he spends as part of that the state money or his own money, money is fungible after that, right? Once he's spending the minimum amount, it's just an extra $375,000 to him. In effect, the condition has been met. The conditional grant to his community is basically an unconditional grant. So they're going to find this. They're going to be at the same equilibrium point. They're going to increase education spending by seventy-five thousand dollars. They're going to increase spending on other goods by three hundred thousand dollars. Right? Tall. Can you explain why if they increase, why doesn't he just stay with five hundred thousand dollars and use the rest of the money for other? Because 
don't hate education. They like all, all of these public services, whether it's education or cops or parks or all of this, are normal goods. So when they have more income, they want more of everything. Because remember what we say when you, say the, when you talk about the income effect? They feel richer. They want to buy more of everything. And that everything is going to include education. They don't want to spend $375,000 more on education. But they want, you know, if they have $375,000 laying around, they're going to spend part of it on education. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just sort of, you know, it's just it's one of the many goods that they spend money on. They'll put some of, it, some of the money on that, but they're going to put, uh, spend some of the money on other stuff too. Exactly. And how, what fraction of additional money goes to education versus other stuff is going to depend entirely on the shape of their indifference curves. In other words, their preferences, the community's preferences. Cool. Okay. So with the conditional block grant, anyone who was initially spending more than the conditional amount, so more than 375, is going to react to the conditional block grant just as they would have reacted to the unconditional block grant. Because they don't have a substitution effect, right? The only thing they face is an income effect. They're richer, they're going to spend part of that money on the, the, the targeted program, but some of that money is going to go to other programs as well. What about folks who were in here? Communities that were initially spending less than 375 on education. When their budget constraint goes from this line to the wiggly line, are they richer? Yes, right? They have an income effect. But what else has changed? The slope of their budget constraint has changed, right? It's gone from being steep to being perfectly horizontal in this range. So they're going to have a substitution effect too. In fact, we're going to see anyone who is located in this range. Sorry, I shouldn't make it wiggly. Let me make it bold. Anyone in this range is going to aggregate up here. Because they can, in fact, spend more on other goods and education by going to the kink point. We're going to see the hollowing out of all of these guys to up here. Question, yeah? Do you always just put the difference curve like at the kink point or at the point that you've calculated? Is it always built in? It goes there if you were in this range initially. Okay, because it has to be like the most right. Like, the most northeast. Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. Exactly, the highest indifference curve. But so let's think about how, suppose we were the governor, right? We were the state government. And we, you know, as the state government, we've decided for various reasons of redistribution and paternalism and efficiency, we've decided we want more education spending in our state. For the same $375,000, if we transfer it to a community out here, we get a little bit more spending, right? They're going to spend part of that grant on education. Part of it they'll spend on other stuff. If we give it to a community that's spending let's say $50,000 on education, we're going to get $325,000 of additional education spending in that community, right? Because they can't use the money for anything else. They can only use it for education. So if we wanted to get more spending, we want to target these grants at communities that are in this area, right? That are low spending. Because we're going to top them up. We're going to get communities to spend at least $375,000. Right? So communities that are spending a lot less than that are going to increase spending more than communities that are all the way out there. It depends on the shape of their preferences, but we think it's less bang for the buck. Right? So that's a way we think about the conditional structure as helping us sort of target this grant. And that's obvious from the, the description of a conditional grant. Right? It says, you must spend this $375,000 in education. That's clearly going to get folks who are not spending even three seventy-five dollars to spend at least that. At least that. Okay. Because we want to target these guys because in this range, the grant has both an income effect and a substitution effect. Out here, we just have the income effect working for us. Questions about this? You guys are asking really good questions. This is sort of a review of all of this stuff in a way, right? Of budget constraints in general. OK, so if you don't have questions yet, I'll ask you questions. OK, so let's do a practice problem. Intergovernmental grants practice problem one. We have a town with $2 million in resources. So their total tax revenues from local taxation is $2 million. They spend $300,000 on public transportation. Suppose the federal government offers a matching grant of 20 cents for every dollar the local community spends on, on transportation. Draw a graph, so a budget constraint graph, showing the effect of this matching grant on the town's budget constraints, and then answer this question. What is the most the town can now spend on transportation? I.e., what's the x-intercept of the budget constraint now? 
So there isn't space. I forgot to leave you a blank slide, but there's some, there is like some blank space on the back page. You can use that. But there's the margins. OK, so go ahead and draw the graph, in, graph and tell me the new x-intercept. OK, let's go ahead and tackle this one. So initially, the town has resources of $2 million, right? And they can choose to spend that $2 million on other goods or transportation or spend some fraction of it on each. So we know the original budget constraint is at $2 million and $2 million. Then the, st oh god. Um, So then the, then the federal government comes through and says, we're going to actually offer you a matching grant. For each dollar you spend on transportation, we're going to kick in 20 cents. In other words, they're getting 20% extra transportation right, for, for whatever they spend. So we know that the maximum they can, they can consume of other goods is still $2 million. But they can get up to 20% more in terms of transportation. So we need to multiply 2 million by 1.2, right? And we're going to get. 1.2 times 2 is 2.4 million is the maximum amount of transportation they can consume. So we're going to have a matching grant, and the new x-intercept is going to be 2.4 million. Uh, this should be connected, sorry. <laughs> really big vertex. Um, so, there, so that's the new budget constraint. And this budget constraint has both an income effect, because it lies above the old one, right? They're richer. They're going to want to spend more on everything, including transportation. But they've also got a substitution effect. The effective price of transportation relative to other goods has now gone down. It's gone, by, gone down by how much? 20%, right? And so they're, um, it's actually not 20%. It's, it's, um, so the old price is um, one. The new price is, uh, yeah, it's 20%. What am I saying? It's 20%. Um, and so they've seen a reduction in the price of transportation, and they're going to, to have a substitution effect as well. Right. So, and the um, so they're gonna get so if they get if they get if they spend six hundred thousand three hundred thousand, right? 
they're going to get an additional 20%. So 1.2 times um, 300 is 360,000. They're getting an additional $60,000. Right. So that's what you said. Yeah, so what, what, sorry, the, why is it? How did you get 2.4 million? That's the X intercept. So oh, okay. what you're saying is they were spending 300. Yeah. So if they didn't change their contribution, they would be consuming 360. Mm -hmm. But we think that the fact that they have a different price for transportation is going to lead them to allocate even more of their budget to transportation, right? Because they're richer and there's a price change. So they could themselves contribute say 350, and then they're going to get 1.2 times 350 in terms of total transportation consumption. Does that make sense? Cool. Other questions? Because remember, what we're graphing on the x-axis isn't what the community is spending on the targeted program, right? It's what they're getting in total. So it's both what they're spending out of their tax revenues, their local revenues, plus what the higher level of government is kicking in. It's total consumption of transportation, part of which will be funded with their own tax revenues and part will be funded with the grant. Does that make sense? OK, because this is a part that gets really confusing for students on exams, that they start plotting what the community is spending on the x-axis. So just keep it in mind. OK, let's do the next problem. The next problem is a little bit tougher. Practice problem number two. Now consider the effect of two alternative $400,000 block grant programs. One conditional and the other unconditional. Thinking about this same town. The town has $2 million in initial resources, is initially uh, in, in its own tax resources. It's initially spending $300,000 on transportation. So same setup. I'd like you to graph the resulting budget constraints for the conditional and unconditional grants and answer the following question. If the town's preferences are such that the unconditional grant leads it to spend a total of $350,000 on transportation, so an increase of $50,000. How much will the town likely spend on transportation with the conditional grant? A little bit trickier. 
You guys want a minute, an extra minute or two? Or are you ready to go? Ready to go? OK, great. OK, so this is also, I mean, I hope watching me draw these and draw these not well right, is also helpful to you. Sometimes you'll misdraw these graphs right, during the exam. The key is to not panic. It's not going to take you a million years to draw it again, I promise. You can quickly redraw it. It's not a big deal. There's extra sheets. Not, not a tragedy. It's, it just, the key is, is to sort of move quickly through labeling the graph and working on the graph so that the logic of the problem is still in your head. So you know, abbreviating is always helpful. Like I just write down 2M. M is the general abbreviation for million. Writing out 2, O, O. You can't even see that. But writing it all out, it just takes an extra second and sort of interrupts your train of thought. So sort of try to keep it quick so you can quickly get the concept that's in your head down on paper. Because you guys know your stuff. Those little things, I think, sometimes trip you up when you're working on exam questions. OK, so let's go ahead and, and draw this one. So this one's a little more complicated, right? So how big is the grant again? It's $400,000. Let's go ahead and start with the unconditional grant, right? Unconditional grant is going to shove out our budget constraint by $400,000. So it's going to go to $2.4 million. And what does the conditioning do? It says you've got to spend the $400,000 on transportation, right? So it's like chopping off this top part. We know this is like 400,000, right? This is 400. That's 2, 2 point. Perfect. OK, so this is our unconditional. You might want to do something like make this bold and then tell me the bold line is bold equals unconditional. So maybe we make this um, squiggly or something and just make it unconditional. Or you can draw arrows. Just make sure it's clear. Um, I know some of you like to use different colors and stuff like that. If you can do that time effectively, terrific. If you can't, that's the first thing to cut. You know, that's the first thing to cut out of your, of your exam technique is if you're switching colors and all this. Two colors really should be enough. You never really need three. Keep it, keep it efficient. Clearly, I'm no artist. So um, no one's looking for a masterpiece here. But you've got to convey the information quickly. OK, so this is not 400. This is 0.4. I, see, I just screwed it up, right? But I'm just going to make a correction and say that's 0.4. Done, right? No reason to redraw it. It's good. We're done. OK, these are our two graphs. So how much was this community initially spending on transportation? 300,000, right? So it was somewhere in here. Where does it go when we give it the unconditional grant? To 350, right? So I'm going to label this. I'm going to go ahead and label this and say it's 300. It's getting kind of dicey because it's getting kind of close, but it's OK. I'm not going to redraw it. It's, not, it's still readable. So this is 0.3. And this midpoint between them, I'm just making a little bit of vertical differentiation so I can label it clearly is 0.35, is 3.50, right? No one's needing to redraw anything. We're still good. So we know that with the unconditional, it's going to this community would locate up here. My indifference curves are clearly going to intersect. We know that's a no-no in general. But as I've told you at the very beginning of this course, it's really, really hard to draw non-intersecting indifference curves. So it's OK. It's OK. This is not micro. I'm not testing you on your indifference curve knowledge. I know you know. We're just going to try to get this information across. OK, so this is where this community would be. And so how much more are they going to spend on other goods under the unconditional grant? So they get an unconditional grant of $400,000. They increase spending on, um, on transportation by 50000 So how much more are they going to consume of? Right, so, they get, so this is going to go up to two. Is that right? One second. I want to make sure this is right. They were at 300, they go to 350. Yeah, so they have a $400,000 grant, so they're going to increase. So it's 2 point, 2 point. Sorry, having a, a moment. Um, they're at 300, they have 400. Uh, so this is going to be 2.35. Yeah, sorry. We all have our seconds, uh, our moments. OK, so that's what they would do under the unconditional grant. They're up here somewhere, right? I'm going to draw a big vertex to make it clear that that's the point they're at, because it's all getting very messy very quickly. These graphs are hard to draw, right? It's hard to make it clear. Sorry, you guys can't see this very well. So this is 300. They go up to 350. They increase their spending by a little, right? But what are they mostly increasing their spending on? 
other goods. Okay, now let's now what does the question ask us? Given that this is what happens with the unconditional grant, what do we expect this town spending to be under a conditional grant? So if they just got the money and got to do, got to do with it what they wanted, they would spend 350 in total on transportation. If we stay, say you must spend at least $400,000 on transportation, how much are these guys going to want to spend? 400,000. We're going to drive, drag them kicking and screaming to 400,000, right? So they're going to locate at the kink. The kink. Okay, so that's the picture. That's what we're looking for. Now I'm going to ask you a couple questions about this. Where do we get more spending on transportation, conditional or unconditional? Conditional, right? We make them go to 400. Where are they better off? Try to ignore the fact that they're intersecting in different curves. I can, let me draw it better. Let me draw you a better image. So imagine we're zooming in a lot. So this is the kink point, right? And this is where the top, they would be here. We're making them go here. Which is the higher indifference curve? This one, right? I mean, I can't draw. I'm really, really bad at this. It's really quite tragic. Um, I should go take classes. Um, OK, so they're better off here. What's another way we could know that they're better off with the unconditional grant? When they were offered the unconditional grant, they could have chosen to spend $400,000 on transportation, right? Did they choose to do that? No, they chose to spend 350. So they had the opportunity to choose the kink point under the unconditional grant, and they chose to not locate there. So we know that they prefer 350 to 400, right? They'd rather spend the extra money on other goods. If we force them to spend it on transportation, sure, they enjoy the extra bit of transportation, not as much as they would have enjoyed extra other goods, right? That's the point. So the, the welfare maximizing point is the unconditional grant, where they spend 350 on transportation and 2.35 million on, trans on other goods, right? But we're going to force them to go over here. And that's because what's the state government's interest? Is it, is it local community welfare maximization today, maybe? No, right? What's the state government want? Better roads. And they're going to use this grant system to get more spending on transportation out of the local communities. That's the objective here. OK. Any questions about this? So on a scale from 1 to 10, how hard a problem was that one? Given that you just learned it like two minutes ago, I would say it was like an 8. Does that feel about right? A 10? A 6? Yeah. What you just told me is exactly what I said to you. It's exactly the same concept, that you unconstrained choose this point, the 350 and 2.35 million point. When I constrain you, I force you to choose something different. You could have chosen that unconstrained, but unconstrained, you didn't like it as much as the other option. It's exactly the same thing. When you're unconstrained, you're going to be best off because you can do with it, do with it as you wish. Do with it as you wish, as you wish. Um, a matching grant can sometimes make you better off than an unconditional grant, because the matching grant can be as big as you wish, in a sense, right? It's, un, it's uncapped often, right? It's, for every dollar you spend, we'll kick in X. So that could make you extremely happy in some ways. So depending on the... On, it could, I'm saying, could, it could be. It depends on how big the match is and how much you like the good that's being subsidized, right? If your state doesn't really love Medicaid spending, even though there's a really high match rate for Medicaid, you may, not be you may not be as happy as with half of that amount in unconditional grants. Does that make sense? Yeah, exactly. OK, so that, yep, question, Kelly. Well, so matching grants are most effective in actually increasing spending on that program. So for Medicaid, we may think that, first of all, we may, the federal government may, may sort of like health spending on the poor, right? It may think that it's a public good worth spending on for whatever reason, for redistribution reasons, for paternalism, for efficiency arguments about spillovers from health care, or maybe it reduces spending on other federal programs like Medicare if people have better health care access when they're younger, right? There's a lot of reasons the federal government might want to encourage medical spending, uh, or medical spending, or medical insurance for the poor. 
And so they might want to incentivize states to spend more on it. And the one way to do that is a matching grant, because a matching grant has the income effect and the substitution effect. The, uh, the conditional grant has a substitution effect, but it only has a substitution effect for what kinds of, of communities or states? Low spending, right? States that are not spending the minimum amount will be strongly influenced by the conditional grant. But the matching grant will increase spending through the substitution effect and the income effect for communities spending any amount. Right, because the slope changes from this to this for all, for all communities. That makes sense? Awesome. OK, so let's think about AFDC. So AFDC used to have a matching grant, and that used to be a matching grant program, and it was converted to a conditional block grant program. Did that weaken or strengthen incentives for the average state, say, that was spending more than the conditional amount? Let's say, they, let's say most states are spending more than the minimum amount. Does switching a, uh, cash welfare from a matching grant to a conditional block grant increase or decrease incentives for the states to spend on cash welfare? Decrease, right? It's getting rid of the substitution effect. What it's doing is it's reducing sort of the subsidy, right, for welfare. And that was part of the effort, right, is that, you know, some folks worried that the matching grant, um, the matching grant structure of cash welfare encourage states to spend more on cash welfare versus other government programs, and they wanted to change those incentives. And so they made it a conditional block grant, which says every state must spend at least X, but after that, it basically becomes a transfer. There are lots of political reasons for this as well. Uh, we won't get into, but when it comes to the incentives, we know for sure that it, uh, the substitution effect for most states was eliminated. The substitution effect only remained for states that were spending less than the conditional amount. Does that make sense? Cool. OK, let's get back to, to lecture lecture. So is it better when I draw? Yeah, I think so too. Um, I think it could be potentially even better if I draw on the board, because I think you might be able to see it better. But this worked OK? Because I think it does two things for you. I think you get to see how I draw these pictures, first of all. And you can see that, you know. So one thing I always encourage you to do is before you draw any indifference curves, draw all the budget constraints. Because that's going to actually tell you where some stuff has to be located, right? Like in this case, I had to figure out where 0.4 had to be, right? What determined where 400,000 was, was the distance between these two lines as I drew them. Then I could figure out where 300,000 and 350 were going to be. But if I started drawing the indifference curves before I drew the second budget constraint, right, it would get complicated. So I really recommend you draw the budget constraints, then you put in the indifference curves. Because that's going to sort of fix where your non-scale drawing has to sort of, has to, has to work, right? It, that's going to help you. So I think one way it helps you, because watching me draw it helps you sort of see how someone draws these graphs. Second, I think it also makes you think through drawing this stuff in class. And I think you ask more questions because of that, because you're sort of seeing it happen more slowly, rather than me throwing some big graph up there and then talking to you about it. So hopefully that helped. But um, let's get back to lecture. OK, so we actually just have one more slide, and then we're done. So um, this will, this will, oh, sorry, we're running over a little bit, but it won't take much longer. So the last thing I want to talk about is the flypaper effect. So the flypaper effect, so how does flypaper work? You put it down, flies stick to it, right? So the flypaper effect is the, idea, is, is the idea that when we throw money at particular programs, right? we subsidize spending on x, or we make grants for y, the question is, do we get more state or local spending on that program? Right, we have seen through the, the budget constraints we've drawn that, we could, that some grant structures actually provide stronger incentives for the, for the lower level of government to actually spend on that program. Unconditional grants being the weakest, right? it doesn't provide a lot of incentive to spend on that program, just a little bit, right? just through the income effect. Conditional block grants bring people up to such, at least some level of spending on that targeted program, while matching grants most effectively increase spending on the targeted program. But you know, we do a lot of grant making in the US. And there's sort of a question. When the federal government allocates money to Medicaid, say, and hands it to the states, or allocates money to uh, reduced price lunches and hands it to the states, do we get more state level spending on that program? Because partly what we're doing, right, in the case of the unconditional grant, we just get a little bit more targeted program spending. We get a lot more other stuff spending. The federal grant, or the state grant to the local government, is basically crowding out spending the state would have done anyway, right? When they increase spending from 300 to 350, when we're writing them a check for what, $400,000, we're just mostly crowding out spending they would have done on transportation anyway, right? We're giving them money and they're spending it on other stuff. That's crowd out. 
So when we talk about the flypaper effect, what we're asking is, to what degree are we actually increasing spending on targeted programs versus just providing resources that are going to spending on other programs, right? OK, so this was, this was a question of great empirical interest for a while. And there was this cross-sectional evidence for a long time. For a long time, folks believed, based on cross-sectional evidence, that the flypaper effect was real. That when we tell, when we hand states checks for certain programs, they increase spending on those certain programs by a large degree. And this is based on cross-sectional evidence. This is your time to look at me skeptically, right? And the cross-sectional evidence suggested that the flypaper effect was true. But why is cross-sectional evidence weak? Because different places differ on more than just whether or not they're getting big grants, right? In fact, they could precisely, they could precisely differ in a way that confounds this regression. For example, states that like to spend on particular programs might actually put time and effort into lobbying the next level of government to provide them resources to spend on those programs, right? If your governor believes that the children are the future and we got to spend a lot on education, he might actually be out of down in Washington seeking federal grants for education, right? So the fact that he's getting grants for education and then his state is spending a lot on education isn't telling us about the effect of grants for education on education spending. It's telling us that this governor loves education, right? That's the problem with the cross-sectional evidence. So we used, there was some quasi-experimental uh, research done that was based on changes in congressional committee power. So an example of that would be, you know, suppose the, the leadership of the House switches, majority control switches, all those ranking members become chairmen, right? And the districts they represent suddenly have a lot more congressional power, you can imagine, right? And so that kind, that's one example of a change in congressional sort of committee power that could trigger different levels of grants to different districts. So they use that kind of quasi-experimental evidence, and they find, in fact, the flypaper effect is not very strong. Money doesn't really go where you send it. it you know, if it's not conditional, if they're not spending more than the conditional amount, they spend it on what they like to spend it on. And this is sort of where we stand now. The flypaper effect is, on average, when we send money out to, lo to lower levels of government, they by and large do with it what they like. We have a lot of crowd out. It's more like the, the little bit of it goes into the target program, a lot of it goes into other programs.